Today's scripture reading will be from the Old Testament, um, Ezra chapter 7, verses 6 through 10. Ezra chapter 7, verses 6 through 10. I'll be reading from the New American Standard. This Ezra went up from Babylon, Babylon, and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord of God, our Lord God of Israel, had given, and the king granted him all the requested, because the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. And some of the sons of Israel, and some of the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, And the temple servants went up to Jerusalem in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. And it came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first of the first month, he began to go up from Babylon. And on the first of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem because the good hand of his God was upon him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you here and uh, appreciate all the visitors and I apologize that you came all this way and now you get to hear me preach. You're probably expecting Brent and he's away so when you get home they'll ask you how the trip went. You'll go, oh, it was all right. So, <laughs> so anyway, I want to thank you all for being here this morning. Especially uh, I want to take the opportunity while I can to uh, thank uh, Tim and Hoyt and Brent for allowing me to preach to you this morning from the Word of God. It's always humbling. I also want to thank, uh, take this opportunity to thank you, uh, Beth and I do, for the prayers and the, the wonderful thoughts that you've expressed in this modern age of text and email and all that about uh, my son Keith. And he's, uh, he's got a long way to go, but he'll get there. And uh, with prayer and uh, encouragement, he should be all right. It'll be a long road. All right, so as you all have a bulletin, I hope, with a lesson outline, uh, I kind of spun Sam and uh, Brent out on my lesson outline when I originally uh, sent it to him. I sent him the wrong file, and Brent said, your outline's eight pages long with 62 references. So I immediately went, I think something's wrong there. So anyway, hopefully you have that. We'll try to follow this best as we can. But one of the things that I want to start out with this morning is uh, with a statement that uh, we as Christians should be proficient in the handling of words of, of God's word. And as we examine this passage of scripture from Ezra, we see three natural talking points. Really, really, there's four. But the the idea of him setting his heart is is a completely different uh, sermon altogether, uh, one that goes very well with uh, Daniel uh, setting his heart to do right. But what I want you to look at, those three natural talking points, and it really lends itself, jumps off the page at you, is is the fact that Ezra had set his heart to study the law, to practice it, and to teach it. Study, practice, and teach. So this morning, this is one lesson that we're going to be talking about. There's one of encouragement. We may not talk exactly on the uh, plan of salvation, uh, the importance of baptism in our life, and the importance of faith, but we, it is one of encouragement. One of the things that uh, the conversation as I was pre- getting ready to teach this is, this is not a lesson. Everybody hear me. I don't want to get back to Tim or Hoyt or Brent. This is not a lesson to drum up Bible class teachers. So if you are Bible class teachers, we appreciate it. That's not what this lesson is about. Furthermore, I'm not recruiting Bible class teachers, see, because it does say teach it here. I don't want you to think about that that's what I'm talking about. But what I am wanting to use that word teach in a context of uh, instruct. I want you to think about when we get to that portion of the letter, uh, how am I instructing people? 
How am I instructing my friends? How am I instructing my family? You see, because at any point in time, any point in time, just like Ezra. Remember, Ezra is going up to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. Cyrus is in control now, and he's releasing the Judean, the children of Israel, to go home. And Ezra's in a time of persecution and captivity, but notice the verse says he set his heart. And so now when the time arises for him to go back to Jerusalem to a period of time, if you will, of ignorance, they're coming out of a disciplinary action by God because of their lack of faith and their lack of attention to God's word. His point in history, his time in history came and he was ready for it. The question is, is are we? So we have friends and family and relatives, uh, co-workers, that any point in time in the day, in the week, the month, in our life, could ask us a Bible question. They could ask us about a point in life. And we need to be ready for that. Hey, Pete, what do you think about? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is say, well, God, this is what God says about that. What do you think about people living together? Well, it's not what I think about it. This is what God says about it. What do you think? Those are the kind of questions we need to be ready because we don't know when that's going to happen. So we need to set our hearts on studying God's law. We must set our hearts on practicing the things we study. And then we must teach. And again, I'm not saying a formalized class where we say, yeah, this is, and we write an outline. I'm talking about being able to instruct that person through God's law and through our own practical ways. We must be prepared to study, practice, and teach. And the main thing about those three items put together is, in fact, it's a gauge of growth, isn't it? How are we maturing? Have we moved from one point to the next? And the ability to be able to instruct somebody on a process or a doctrine that we've learned is a sign of growth. And if we can't do that, then we're not growing. And we need to be encouraged to be able to do that. The key here, then, is to know God's plan, to be familiar with Scripture. We may never know who or what comes along. We may only get one chance to teach the gospel to somebody, and we need to be proficient in it. The question then is, is as we become familiar with Scripture, do we know how to be godly people? Do we know how to be a godly husband, a godly wife, a parent, an employee, an employer? The list goes on. That's why Bible study at this point in time is about preparation and it's essential to our spiritual well-being and it needs to be an integral part of our lives. Being prepared for God's work is one of the most important functions we as Christians are charged with. Ezra set his heart to study the law of the Lord. It promotes growth. So as we think about studying the Bible, then we should ask the question, why? Why should we study the Bible? Well, the first thing in 2 Timothy 3.16, a passage that we're all familiar with, Timothy there tells us, or Paul tells us to Timothy, that all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So taking the other side of the coin of that, if we're not studying and reading, now I'm not saying there's different kinds of study, right? I hope everybody has time in their schedule to just read their Bible, to become familiar with the logistics of the Bible, right? Old Testament, New Testament, epistles, gospels, all that. There's that kind of reading, and then there's where we do reference study, where we break it down and we do it either privately, family, or as a corporate, right? We come together as a body of Christ and we study. But notice what it says here. First of all, it's inspired by God. It's profitable. We all understand the word profit, right? Nobody invests money not to make a profit. We all study because it's inspired by God. It's profitable. It's adequate. You know, you take a college class and they issue you a textbook. Sometimes that textbook's not adequate. What do they give you? Well, we need you to go buy this supplemental book. We need you to have this supplemental book. 
This doesn't need a supplemental book. It's adequate. And it's equipped for every good work. If we're not studying it, we're not familiar with it, we don't know what all those good works are. What's really powerful about the word of God is in John 17, 17, it says we are sanctified by his word and his word is truth. The words that I have spoken to you, John records Jesus saying, are spirit and are life. Jesus' words are life. You know, you can go on the internet and you can read commentaries or you can read uh, reference books or talking with friends. And in this day and age, nothing means what it means. Right? Nothing means what it means. We've got to break it down and we've got to, well, what is truth? Come on, what is truth? Well, you're holding a book in your hands that is truth. Not only that, there's not another book that you can read that has life. This book has truth and life. We're sanctified by that word. We're set apart. It brings us into relationship with God. There's no other book that does that. 2 Timothy 2, 14 and 15 says... Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Handling accurately the word of truth. We are to study to show ourselves approved to be able to defend the truth at any time. I'm an electrician. Right? I've been an electrician for, well, doesn't matter how long. But I've been been an electrician for a long time. And if I get an apprentice that comes up to me and says, hey, Pete, uh, you know, I was doing this the other day. How does that work? And I go, well, I don't know. Uh, you know, it just does. Well, how about, can you show me, show me, uh, get one of your books out from when you were an apprentice and show me, show me. I have a book that tells me that. And if I did, I wouldn't know. See, don't be ashamed. When somebody asks us a question, we should be familiar enough to at least get them in the right direction, at least be able to uh, marshal them into a person that does know. There's a separation there in Berea in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. They were more noble-minded. Now, they weren't more noble-minded because they were good people. Now, they were, but that's not why they were noble people, noble-minded people. It's not because they had any special gift. It's not because they were rich, not because they were poor. No, because they knew the scriptures. They studied the scriptures. They were able to take those truths that were, being able, that were being taught to them, they were able to process them and rightly apply them to their lives, made them stand out. Here's the, one of the points that we were making, that uh, studying, practicing, and teaching is a sign of growth. Paul says in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 15 through 16, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up. What if we all stayed with the mentality of a kindergartner. Well, that's a bad example because there are some people that I work with that (laughs) you can't come in contact with people with that have the attitude and the mindset of a kindergartner. But if we don't grow, if we don't grow, Paul says, in fact, he doesn't give us an option. He says we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by which that every joint supplies Every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, if each individual part grows and matures, what does the verse say there that happens to the corporate whole? Causes the growth of the body. That's the chain principle, right? Chain is only as strong as the weakest link. It's only as strong as the weakest link. And it's to build itself up in love. There's sanctification and growth from studying the word of God. We need to grow individually because it comes back to that scenario that I just gave you. The congregation is as strong as the weakest link. And that paradigm, by the way, that paradigm applies to every relationship or situation. Right? In every relationship, the relationship is only as strong as the weakest person in the relationship. So... First Peter, Peter says in 1 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3, Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, 
so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. So not only is there a setting of one's heart, there should be a longing in one's heart to crave for the word so that we can grow. Right? I remember years ago when my youngest son, Brian, he decided he wanted to take golf lessons, and uh, I am in by no means athletic. I, there's just, I, I live in a world where I believe in balance. All of you that are talented, it's because of me, because I have no talent. <laughs> so anybody that's balanced, there's always somebody, that, or anybody that's talented, there's always somebody that has no talent. I can't play guitar, so all of you guys that play guitar, it's because of me. So uh, I remember Brian. He was taking golf lessons, and I'm, and I'm struggling, right? They would clear the driving range line because they didn't know where the ball was going. And, and Bob, the guy that was teaching Brian how to play golf, would say, Brian, you need to do this. He'd do it. Brian, you, you, he'd do it. That's what it's saying here. As newborn babies... See, newborn babies do not, are not born knowing no. They're born knowing yes. They will do anything. They're a sponge. They learn negative thoughts and negative and the word no from life. So like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word that you may grow. But that's where it, does, it doesn't end there. Once we're baptized, we may hear the word, we may obey the gospel, we may be baptized... And we may live by faith, but as it's recorded in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, after that first great gospel sermon, what did those first disciples do? Continually devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and prayer. Now, I'm not saying studying is the end of all. It's not, it's not you know, prayer, communion, daily Bible reading, fellowship. It's all important. We're focusing on study right now. In Hebrews, the fifth chapter, verse 11 through 14, we should grow and become teachers. Now, this is the passage I want to throw my disclaimer out again. I'm not saying everybody has to become a Bible class teacher. Now, in this context of Hebrews, of course, that's what he is talking about. I'm getting somewhere else in this passage, but I had to get through this. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you've become dull of hearing, for by this time you ought to be teachers. You need, again, to have someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. See, these folks are taking two steps forward, one step back, right? It, you should be progressing, but you're not progressing because we've got to keep backing up you ever known anybody like that? They just can't put anything to bed? They just can't put anything to rest? The Jehovah Witness knock on the door and whew, their faith is shattered. They run into somebody from a denomination, the Mormon, whew, they're shattered. They just can't put their faith to bed. In other words, they don't study and convict themselves and learn and grow to a point where they're convicted and they're not an ashamed workman. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. See, it's a, it's a process of, of maturity. So let me see if I can illustrate that for you this morning. So, good is recognizable. Would you agree? Uh, we all know that something is good because it's good. All right. We all know something's evil because it's evil. It, it, it's self-evident. It's evil. But I love that word discern. You ever thought about that word discern? See, discernment about good and evil comes from being wise. And, and, and my real simple definition of being wise is to know the outcome of something based on life experience. And so therefore, it's relative. There's people... I know it's hard to believe, but there's people more wise than me. Eight-year-olds are more wise than newborn babies because they've got life experience that they know certain behavior uh, has an outcome of certain results, right? Put your finger in a, in a flame, it's going to get burnt. 
We learn that pretty quick. <clears throat> when it comes to good and evil, though, what the Bible teaches us that certain decisions up front look good, but where do they end up? See, the end doesn't justify the means all the time. Same thing with good. We know certain decisions made lead to good. And so that discern, the, the ability to get in there and, and feed upon the word of God uh, gives us the ability to make that discernment between good and evil. So that gives us a good opportunity then to move on to practice. <clears throat> this is uh, kind of what you know uh, we talk about when we say, don't do what I say, or don't do what I do, do what I say. Well, we're going to do the opposite of that. Some of the hardest scriptures to understand, in my opinion, <clears throat> are the ones that mean what they say and say what they mean. We want to take them apart. John 14 and verse 15, I mean, it just can't get any simpler than this, right? You can all quote John 14 and 15. If you love me, you'll keep my commands. Now, I guarantee you, you could pick up probably three or four commentaries that would have pages and pages and pages on what that doesn't mean. What it means is, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. John 7, 24 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall. And I would argue to you this morning, the house is your faith. And when we take our time to put God's laws and commandments into practice and we prove to ourselves that they work, not that we're testing God, but I believe that tests in your faith and life happenstance build relationship with God because once we pass through one tragedy or one event and we go, you know what, that was awful. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. But you know what? I'm still faithful on the other side. I'm a better person for it. Wait a minute. Hey, wait. And then you start to grow. So now when the next thing comes along, your house doesn't fall down. Your faith remains strong. No matter what comes against it. So practice and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. James, the first chapter, verse 22 says, Do not merely listen to to the word, pretty easy to do, right? If I sat up here, oh, your attention may stray a little bit, but if I sat here and I read you the book of Ezra, you could, you could tolerate that. You could hear it. Uh, James is one of the hardest books for some of our denominational friends to listen to. If, in fact, if they had their way, it wouldn't be in the New Testament because it says, practice what you hear. Well, if you live by faith, you, wait a minute, you can't. Yes, you can. You can practice what you've heard and live by faith. And what he's saying here is, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. What I, basically the writer there is saying is it doesn't make any sense. You cannot hear what God says and what Jesus says and how Jesus performed and walk away and not practice it. James 2.14, specifically verse 17, Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. And I love that passage of scripture. Because if we want to get into a, 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 a tussle over words, if, if we want to argue that you can't be saved by works, and I'm not saying we are, but I'm using it in this argument, then in this passage, then if you gave your brother a coat, you'd be working. So don't give your brother a coat, you see. If you're going to live by faith and your brother's cold, don't give him a coat because you're working. You're trying to earn God's righteousness. That's not what that says, is it? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. And Abraham is a perfect example of it. He was proven righteous because he believed, 
and he did what God said. This walk, this practice of what we've studied is so important that it has some outward manifestation. In, it, in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 1, Paul argues or instructs the Ephesians, we are to work, walk in a worthy manner of his calling. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. We talked about that today in class, right? Trampling under the foot, the Son of God. Well, what this is saying is that we should walk in a manner that's worthy of our calling. So what did, how were we called? We were called by God's Son. We were called by the cross. We were called by sacrifice, by a death, by a burial, by a resurrection. And if we're not walking according to that calling, then we should be ashamed. That's what Paul tells Timothy. That's brought out even more if you turn your Bibles over to 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, and verse number 12, and examine that short passage. Our walk, uh, so that you may walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom of glory. And I love that imagery there. Because what that imagery there is, is everybody seen the scales of justice, right? You got two little pans on some chain by a fulcrum, and, and, and it balances well, what Paul is saying there is, is God is on one of those plates. Your walk is on the other. And what Paul's challenging us to do and encourage us to do is balance that scale. Are we walking in such a way? So to back up, how can you walk in the correct way if you don't know how you're supposed to be walking? Right? First John, the second chapter, verses 5 and 6. But whoever keeps his word... Now... <clears throat> Again, getting back to James, you can't keep his word by just listening to it. You could maybe in your heart and in your mind. But keep his word in him. The love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. See, love is an emotion. I can tell you that I love you all day long. And I can be very sincere in that. But you can't see love. Right? It's an emotion. You can't see love. The only way you can see love is if I demonstrate it to you. It's manifested by the work, by the practice. So after we've studied it, after we've practiced it, now we move on to the last part of uh, what Ezra's uh, call was, is he taught it. And again, I want to take one small step back and say we instruct it. And there's a lot of ways to instruct the Word of God. Obviously, there's... We talk about it. We can demonstrate it by just walking around and people go, well, why is he so different? Why is she, what's she doing over there? I see her praying over her meal every day at lunch. Whatever it is, people can see it. We're instructing people. Matthew 28 and verse number 20, the Great Commission, Jesus tells his disciples there, teaching them to observe part of what I've commanded you, these, these five things over here. No, that's not what he says. All that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end uh, of the age. It's a sign of growth and maturity. Now, again, we don't all have to be Bible class teachers, but we can teach our neighbors. We can teach our friends. We can teach our family. We open doors by our example. But here's the real problem, <clears throat> and, it, and it, it's growing momentum. Uh, you know, I read, I read quite a bit of uh, stuff, uh, books that I get off the, off the Internet, and, and, and I listen to a lot of different uh, channels on the, on the radio, and I listen to sermons and classes and all kinds of stuff. I love that stuff. And, uh, but the problem is what you hear in it is if you turn your Bibles over to Romans 10, in today's age, if, if you don't entertain me, then uh, that's not worship. You know, if I'm not on an emotional high and, uh, you know, got my arms swinging and we're dancing in the aisles and doing all that kind of stuff, which clearly in the Old Testament there's never an example of that uh, uncontrolled type of worship, we try to replace that with zeal, don't we? We think we can overcome lack of knowledge with zeal. If I, could, if I can show you how enthusiastic I am about something, then I must know what I'm talking about. Because 
that's just the way we look at things. Well, Paul has something to say about that with the Jews. They may have been wrong about some things, but I don't think we can argue that they weren't zealous for their belief in God. Now, it may be perverted. It may have been warped, but they were definitely zeal, had zeal for it. For I testify, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Isn't that interesting? What's he really saying there? They're not saved. Right? They're not saved. For I testify about them, for they have a zeal for God. So he's made two statements already. They're not saved, but they have zeal for God. Now, whoa, in this day and age, if you have zeal for God, you must be in relationship with him and in communion. For I testify but about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. So if we're not studying the Bible, we're not practicing what we teach, we can have all the zeal in the world, but it can, be, it can have a foundation of the wrong knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to... Us, oh, there's the point, see. They're seeking to establish their own. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. Knowledge can puff you up, right? I know some pretty smart people. You know, and they can be arrogant at times. Well, so can I, you know. I find that hard to believe, but I can be. Uh, and it can puff us up, and that's what happened. The, the, uh, Sam did a great job with a sermon uh, last week, I think it was, with the foolishness, right? It's the ability to become humble, to condescend, to let go. So let me read it again. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. So zeal is not a replacement for knowledge. So in conclusion then, let's think about what we've talked about. Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6. This is how critical this is. Hosea, the prophet, says that God says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Were they destroyed? Oh, yeah, they were destroyed, right? They went Assyrian captivity, Babylonian captivity. Hebrews, the second chapter, we have the same warning, which we studied on Sunday morning, right? Take care lest you drift away. And then the imagery there is of a boat tied up to a pier, and the moorings come loose, and the tide comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out. Next thing you know, the boat is on the horizon, lost. Take care lest you drift away. Isaiah 5.13 says, Therefore my people go into exile for their lack of knowledge. Ezra confirms that statement by saying he set his heart to be prepared to teach them so that when they came out of exile, they would know the law. Lack of knowledge. God wants us to keep his commands. He wants us to walk in a worthy manner, but we can only do that if we study and know his will. I'm going to ask some questions and keep them in context. Don't answer them out loud. How often do you study your Bibles? How often do you read your Bible? I'm just talking about, you know, you don't have to worry about what if means or what did not mean there. You know, how often do you read? Just read it. Pick up a book and read it. I'm not even talking about a daily Bible reading. I'm just saying, what does James say? Man, I've never read... Uh, Zephaniah, what does Zephaniah say? And you read it. Now, here's the question. Keep it in context. How Do we know our Bibles as well as we know our occupation? Right? So I've been an electrician probably 40 years, 45 years, something like that. And I am a completely different electrician now than I was 40 years ago, right? It's like this. So when it comes to our Bible, what's our point of reference with our Bible knowledge? Isn't it the day we are baptized? So if we're a year away from our baptism, our conversion, or if we're five years or ten years, there should be some change. It shouldn't be a flat, linear. It should be upward, right? It's a sign of growth. Now, just for a second, if you have your Bible, take your Bible in your hand or your phone iPad. I'm not sure which one the Apostle Paul had, but 
He had one of those. I just want you to, I just want you to hold your Bible in your hand for a minute. For the word of God in Hebrews 4, for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of, of him who we have to do. So those of you that are joining me in this little exercise, in your hand, you have the most powerful book ever written. You ever thought about that? He says it's a sword. And I, I kid around with Beth sometimes. I'll be looking, hey, where's my sword? She knows I'm looking for my Bible. So that must mean I'm not studying. I gave, I gave myself up there. So where's my sword? It's a sword. It's inspired. You know the Jews wanted to have communion with God, and Jesus dwelt among them, right? He dwelt, he tabernacled them. You have, right here in your hands, you have a direct connection to God. This is God's mind right here in these pages. Anything you want to know about God is right here. It's right here in your hand. It's sharper. It's inspired. It has life. It can change lives. We all know of stories of, of people that are, have been converted from lives that you would never think possible. And yet, they read God's word, they hear the gospel, and they're changed. But on the same token, what I want you to think about is, if you're holding the most powerful book ever written that can change lives, has the mind of God in it, has life in it, what does that say about 2 Timothy 2.15? Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of God, the word of truth. You can also abuse it, right? Because it's, it's just kind of stagnant. It just kind of sits there. It's a book. It's a thing. We pick it up, and it's how we use it. So the question as we close then is, are you proficient in the word of God? Are you practicing the word of God? the things that you're looking at and reading? Are you living a life that's worthy of the manner of which we were called? Are you instructing through your actions, through your ability to, to work, to use the word of God? And as I stated earlier today, this was more of a lesson of encouragement. We didn't really address the plan of salvation. But I do want to go back to one of the things that we did talk about in John 6, 63, is that this is the word of life. John 8.32 says that uh, the truth will make you free. And earlier in the chapter, he said his word is truth. And so if you've been studying the word of God or you're interested in, in making a change in your life and you feel the call of the gospel this morning, which is the fact of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, uh, we are more than happy to help you with that this morning and uh, assist you there. If you have uh, need the prayers of the congregation for any reason at all, uh, Trevor's going to lead us in song number 326, and we'll ask you to make those wishes known as we stand together and sing.